putting on this year. Um, we have a whole series, oh, my mic just came on. Uh, we have a whole series of events. This is the first, uh, I'll just give you a quick overview of what's coming up. Uh, in two weeks, we're having one called Privilege and Power, um, about how to talk about privilege, both illustrate and obscure society's most basic concentrations of power. Uh, then on October 3rd, we're having one on the future of investigative journalism. Uh, on October 18th, we're having a really remarkable speaker, uh, the former president of the American Civil Liberties Union, a professor at New York Law School, Nadine Strassen, who's going to talk about hate speech and how we deal with that. Um, and then on November 20th, we're having a panel on cultural appropriation. So we have a whole bunch of topics, some of them controversial, uh, hopefully interesting, and a, a diverse panel on each of them to uh, talk and share views. So that's coming up. And if any of you are interested, if you're not on the CFE email list and would like to be notified about events, uh, Ange Holmes, who's the coordinator of the center, has uh, two clipboards. Maybe start one at one side of the room and one on the other side, Ange, if you would. And if anyone would like to be on our mailing list, uh, just put your name and email address and we'll uh, we won't bombard you with emails, but we will send you emails of upcoming events. We're also going to be having the second year of our film series that we do jointly with the School of Image Arts here on films uh, dealing with uh, repression, dissent, and free expression. And uh, that will be beginning um, in October. So enough about what's coming up. Let's talk about tonight. Uh, tonight's uh, panel is dealing with the topic called the censorship of art. You know, throughout history, art has been censored for challenging standards of decency, propriety, and good taste. Um, that history of censorship continues in Canada today. Uh, some of us may not be aware of the extent to which it's continuing. In fact, I, th I think we're moving back to a more sensorial age where we deal with offensive, uh, questionable, troubling ideas, images, objects, uh, events, by silencing them, by preventing them from happening, rather than other ways of dealing with them, such as more speech, controversy, uh, challenge, discussion, criticism, boycotts, uh, uh, protests, uh, or whatever. Um, so tonight we're going to be asking, why are we, you know, what are we experiencing in terms of censorship in the arts? What are the costs? And we have three really interesting artists who are going to uh, talk with us tonight, talk with you, and talk about their experiences. And so um, at this point, I was supposed to introduce the moderator for tonight's event, who is to be Paul Kennedy, who is the moderator for CBC Ideas. CBC is co-sponsoring tonight's event. But Paul had a family issue come up and isn't able to be here. So do you ever go to a play and you get a little note in the program saying that the understudy is and you say you feel like you're getting cheated. Well, unfortunately, that's happening you, to you tonight. Uh, I'm filling in for Paul Kennedy, and uh, he's always, I've always been amazed at how he can moderate so successfully uh, ideas, panels on every subject in the world and seem knowledgeable and ask good questions. And, and I found out part of his secret because uh, uh, CBC Ideas has some wonderful producers who interview the uh, participants and, and give the moderator some questions. So I'd all, in addition to thanking Ange Holmes, who does all the work to make these things happen, uh, I want to thank uh, Lisa Godfrey, who's uh, one of the producers at CBC Ideas, for sharing the notes she was giving Paul with me, so I won't be quite as incompetent as I otherwise would be. So let me start by introducing our, our panel. I'm delighted uh, to introduce our first uh, uh, panelist, uh, Tim Edler. Do you want to come up, Tim? Um, Tim is with a firm called Realities United, along with his brother Jan, which develops and supports architectural solutions that incorporate new media and informational technologies. Uh, one, of the ma one major focus is the outward communicative capacity of architecture. Another one is the quality of the user experience of inside spaces, which are both in function and appearance, essentially augmented and changed by additional layers carrying information, media, content, and communication. I mention all that because uh, Tim, uh, well, I'll let him tell you the story about the massive art installation that he created for the Toronto Transit Commission. 
That was so. What did it cost? Uh, I have no idea. But a lot of money in uh, in one of the new TTC stations. And how many days before it was to go live? Three. Three days. Uh, the TCC pulled the plug on it and didn't allow it to. So he'll tell you about that. Uh, Tim studied computer science and architecture at the Technical University of Berlin. He's joined us and we have flown him in from Berlin to, to speak with us. He graduated in 1994 as a diploma architect. From 94 to 97, he worked for in, in different architects' office. And since uh, 1966, he's worked as a co-founder of the Berlin-based art group, Kunst and Technik. So we're really pleased to have him with us tonight. And it, the story he's going to tell you is a really interesting and I find, in part, disturbing one. Our second uh, panelist is Huli McLaughlin. Uh, do you want to come up, Huli? Huli is an artist working in Toronto. He explores the space where we are seduced by beauty and then shocked and disturbed by the eruption of our base desires and fears. Uh, his themes include sex, religion, violence, and the erotic. Uh, female agency figures prominently in his artwork. After decades of developing and creating a body of work largely produced during live model uh, sessions using charcoal, oil, uh, acrylic, photography, and other media, he began to show publicly uh, only over the past three years. His previous uh, academic work included biological sciences, where he holds a doctorate, doctoral degree, as well as languages and East Asian studies. Hooley's had a very interesting career. He worked uh, at the Ontario Science Centre for more than 30 years. He retired in 2016. At the time he retired, he was the chief, chief science officer and vice president of the Ontario Science Centre. He also teaches at the University of Toronto, where he has, uh, has a, been a course lecturer in museum studies for the last 15 years and holds the title of adjunct professor in the Faculty of Information. So welcome, Hooley. Thank you. Um, our third panelist, uh, is Angelica Sykes. Uh, Angelica's uh, academic credentials include a diploma in applied photography, which she completed at Sheridan College, and a Bachelor of Design in Advertising, which she completed at the Ontario College of Art and Design University. I guess it's called OCAD. OCAD. OCAD U uh, now. And Angelica has worked in fine art framing and installation, curating independent galleries, Brand development for a beachfront hotel in Mexico. You know, when you're a serious photographer or artist, you have to do a lot of different jobs to put food on the table. Uh, and many contract projects as a photographer shooting for local clients as, such as Toronto Life. And Yalika currently represents directors and photographers in Canada at Sparks Productions and Sparks Photographers located in Liberty Village. So we're delighted to have you bringing your experience as an artist and also as a curator to uh, our topic tonight. So I'd like to start with Tim, if I may. Uh, could, you, could you maybe share with us your story of, of, uh, that I pointed to but didn't say much about? Okay, I'm uh, glad. Um, I think I'll make it rather concise. So we oh, have, take, um, take your time. <laughs> it's a really, uh, it's, it's a, one of the it's most dramatic ten, stories of censorship in Toronto in years. So. It's a ten, ten year Those story. Yeah, ten. Uh, well, I warn you. <laughs> as long as you have ten, ten years can, to tell it, you're also. Um, I, I'm not going to, to run through the project uh, uh, like in a lecture, but we will have some images in the background. I think you get a feeling. So, roughly, what it's about um, we were part of uh, the TTC's um, work of the extension of the subway, the Spadina subway line, which I think included five or six uh, subway stations, for which uh, it was always a team commissioned an architect's office and an artist, so we played the role of the artist here, uh, which meant due to the production process um, for a, a railroad, it's a long planning phase, it actually started in 2008, 10 years, that we began to think about uh, the art installation, for which budget was given, $500,000. Um, and uh, I think um, like two or three years later, um, we actually were at the point that it was um, decided and um, talked with everyone that we would have an installation uh, which would be a, a number of chandeliers. Each one um, of these chandeliers is a enlarged 16-segment display. It's one of these computer 
uh, displays of the 1970s or 1960s where you can make, as you can see with these sticks, you can make uh, simple signs and letters. And the idea was to have the public type in uh, um, phrases and these phrases would then be lit up and um, be a, a mixture or an overlay of one's a certain message um, which is put in by people uh, plus um, a function that you could not deny it would also give lighting. Uh, in the process of discussion I think the first difficult point for us was that we could not as a, as a side dish for the story. Uh, um, we, we could not convince them to allow us to be the sole lighting of the station, which was the original concept that uh, it's just only the message lighting the space. Uh, because uh, when we started the project, um, we did not think of hate speech and uh, social media back then. It was more about um, maybe a fear of things being stupid. And, and we were fascinated by the idea that whatever stupid or unfriendly you could produce, or even beautiful, uh, it, it would always also do the lighting. So it was always a mixture of something individual, but something that also is a, um, a service for the community, if you will. And um, so we went on, and um, I think it was then more geared at production, and um, so we created software, we created these chandeliers, and um, there were, uh, in parallel, there were a number of discussions we had with the TTC with lawyers being concerned about um, what are the limits or what are the dangers of people entering stuff. And um, a few years ago, it was mostly scenarios like um, if someone types jump and someone who is in a suicidal mode would be triggered um, by that information to jump. Um, so we, there were some concerns, but um, we came to the point, I think the lawyers of the TTC checked that, that they could still uh, let us go forward. And it was not until, uh, you mentioned last December, when the entire subway line went into operation that the then, uh, I think, also partially new management um, became more aware of what was happening and, and pulled, pulled the trigger because they felt that the TTC is taking a risk by allowing people to enter anything. So before we go to that, um, maybe to, to give you an understanding like what is our concept of allowing people to enter, you have these terminals, there are altogether four terminals in the station, and you can type in characters, and as you type, these characters will appear and form a repetition. So if you type like H, you will have H, 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 and if you type in the second letter, you will have the uh, second letter repeat of its first one. And um, so our idea was that um, because it's so quick um, to, to make it a scenario of um, a, a, a public in a nutshell. It's basically the people on the station that can type in things and we thought if, if someone is annoyed, there's always four terminals, it's just the hit of one button, it's, it's gone. So we thought, and that's also what, how we talk to the TTC saying, it's not something that's on the wall and you cannot take down, but you can down it take it down immediately. So there was a mechanism which is also programmed today, um, but um, of course uh, uh, concerns can always grow and I think that's the point we are at. So it was um, decided to not um, allow it to go online and right now we are in a discussion with the TTC uh, on, on what base um, the project could be uh, launched again, uh, which will then imply a number of measures. Maybe it's, it's too long now to explain it all, I don't know. Um, so so, so b b basically the idea will be that... Um, uh, I'm sorry, before you go on to... So what, the image you're seeing, this is built in. What's the, it, what's the, do you remember the station name? It's called Pioneer, Pioneer so Village. So you know the line that goes out to Vaughan. It's one yeah. of those new stations. So this is all in the station right now. Yeah, it's installed. It's just the lights don't come on. Yeah, the, now the light is not on because we also refuse to have it on as long as the entire thing is not working. 
And so people could type in, they could, how long could the words be? It's actually, we, we limited to a maximum of 10 characters, which is really short. But when you go in the station, it's, it's, I mean, it's so huge, it's also difficult to spot actual words. I mean, that's another aspect of it. The readability is very limited, and, the, and, and entirely the, the, the idea that people could really read and be offended is also something which I think will not happen all the time, to put it that way. So the conception was to essentially let the lighting in the station be created by the, uh, the passengers going through the station. Yes. Right? And... So it's so, a so new formula. I think that's what we are going to agree with them. It's, it's like in the final stages, hopefully, um, is that um, um, th there were concerns that pe things would be up there that people would be uh, negatively affected. And, and the way they put it forward was very broad. And, um, and they also had the idea that we would create a blacklist for certain terms and then even blacklist wouldn't be enough. Then there was a talk about creating white lists, like you know, prefab words that you uh, could type in. But I think we, then we could. Um, Did they give you examples of what their fears were, um, other than jump or? Um, I think there was a general fear that that of course um, um, racist um, denouncing yeah. expressions in general would be up there, and they, I think they were mostly afraid. Well, not mostly, but they were partially afraid of things that could cause panic, like if there's fire is up there. Um, they were afraid of things that violate the law, that the TTC could be held responsible, and, but they were also um, concerned about things that would make people feel uncomfortable. That's a very broad thing then. So I think the solution, uh, as I hope and, and understood from discussions we, are, we were aiming, is that um, the, the threshold will be both terms that are considered dangerous as such because they have the ability to cause a mass panic, uh, plus things that can be considered hate speech. We talked about this briefly on the telephone. And so the process will be uh, if, if someone sees something there uh, where uh, it's not enough to push a button to raise it, or as a person is maybe not, does not know about that there's a button, uh, you can call the TTC and... <laughs> Be on hold for 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, and uh, make a complaint and the TTC will then erase what's on there, if it's still there, and uh, put the term in quarantine and have a committee look at it. Whether... <laughs> You think he's making this up, don't you? <laughs> no, no. It's, um, I think that, that's um, this basically the discussion we are having, and to, to say um, uh, someone has to make a decision if, if something actually is uh, illegal for the TTC it, uh, to, to you know, carry out there. And um, so, although I'm not from Canada and I'm not a legal expert, my understanding is that we are talking about um, the issue of hate speech, that there's, um, there's, there's a probably um, a high ceiling for what can happen until then, from my understanding. And it's less about uh, things which are um, inappropriate or uh, somehow not OK. Uh, or um, it, it, I think we're not talking about uh, four-letter words uh, uh, where people think they should not be in the public. We are talking about things which are considered illegal. That's, that's the discussion we're having right now. And today we had a short, short discussion as well, um, where I was a bit uncertain if we are still talking about the same thing, but, but it's, it's an ongoing process where we have always to readjust like what should be the triggers for something to be banned. Okay, well, we'll come back to yeah. some of the stuff. Uh, I mean, as a person who spends a lot of time dealing with hate speech, it's really unclear what 10 character word would constitute hate speech under Canadian law. I mean, words in the, by themselves don't constitute hate. Anyways, we can talk more about that. Well, Huli, um, um, do you have a sense there's a chill on controversial art these days? Um, 
maybe you could share a little bit about your own experiences with your work and, and uh, some of the challenges you faced in showing it. Uh, sure. I, before I do, I, I, I'm just reminded as I'm, as I'm sitting here, when I was really young, there was a TV radio show called Queen for a Day. Now, you have to be pretty old to remember this because it was in the 1950s and 60s. But anyway, in that show, and the show was 99% women. Well, it was called Queen for a Day. Uh, there'd be four or five contestants. They'd be hauled in. They'd have to tell their terrible story of, of tragedy and being hard done by, by society. And then the audience would applaud. The one that got the most applause for being the most pathetic would win a washing machine or something of that nature. So I don't want to imply that. Uh, that I don't want to be uh, um, thinking that my story is even more upsetting and I'm more of a victim. <laughs> <laughs> On the contrary. It's a different kind of story. That's yeah, it's a different kind of story. And, you know, also, I do, I'm fully aware of the fact that, if I'll, I'll, I'll um, hint broadly at the type of art I'm talking about, it, it will upset some people. But I think that's the whole point that we're trying to get at here, and something that you alluded to, Tim. And that is that uh, the thinking of the TTC being concerned about things that might upset people. I think I want us to think about that for a second when you hear my story. I'm talking about drawings, paintings, and um, some collages where you have a photographic material that's ma manipulated with paintings and drawings. So these are basically depictions, okay? They're not uh, news stories, uh, they're not um, Nobody's actually hurt in my art. Uh, they are just depictions. They're ideas. And what I wanted to get across today was what happened to me made me think about what it means to live in a society that appears to me to be increasingly worried about having things on display that might ups upset somebody. They might be upsetting to somebody. Therefore, they shouldn't be on display. I'm not going to name the place, but it'll be obvious where it is if you know anything about the city. Um, anyway, back in the fall of 2016, this was shortly, uh, within a, was like a year, that I, I, by the time I, that I started to show anything, I approached this gallery, which at that time was one floor, and it was a combination cafe gallery. It was right across the street from the AGO, so perfect location as far as I was concerned. And uh, I had shown other places, but I, I asked them if I could set up a show for the following year, for the fall of 2017. And I made arrangements to do that. And I put it on their website. It was on their website that advertised what the show was about. Not only that, um, material from shows I'd had before were on a site that I have, a website that they had access to. Okay. So nothing is really hidden from them. Not only that, following during the following year, late 2016 into 2017, they opened a basement gallery, uh, and there were a number of small shows, and I participated in those shows by having a few works, a couple of works on about three or four of their shows. Much of my work, uh, all of it, is, is, is erotic. Uh, much of it has to do with religion and nudity and the concept of female, um, female action. Because in my art, I'm looking at the, the concept that the, the uh, Abrahamic religions are based on the female form, and the, the female body. And that much of what we do in our Western society is based on that and prohibitions around that. So I'm showing depictions of the Virgin Mary, nude, masturbating, Pictures, and I also show uh, issues, uh, connections to, to uh, quotes from the Koran, where I'm showing the same type of thing. And all that I'd shown before. Now, came to the uh, show I was having. This is the upstairs where they do have a cafe, but it's an art gallery cafe. And I will point out that there are art gallery cafes even in the AGL. Okay, so there, there, there are public, private galleries, which are part cafe, part gallery, are effectively galleries. And these are places for public discourse and the understanding that they're helping our civilization, I think, have an expression of what it means 
to speak a language which is free of condemnation, and allow ideas to be explored. So the show was put up, <clears throat> and uh, late in the evening, was, uh, I, I was approached by one of the three owners who said, a bit concerned about a couple of these pieces because they go pretty far in mixing sex and religion. Uh, I said, well, I don't want to change anything. But the next morning, I thought, well, maybe I could go. Since if they're really agitated, I'll go there and I'll find out. If they don't want these two works in the show, I'll put up uh, a notice saying they've been taken down. And I'll say why they've been taken down. But I walked in there, and all three owners were there. They confronted me, and they said that they not only wanted those two down, they wanted the rest of it out immediately. They basically closed the show down. Um, I don't blame them. They're, they're running a business. I'm not angry with them, not at all. I get it. I get why they did it. They were concerned. They were worried. They were upset. They're running a private business. They have a right to do it. I'm not upset with them at all. What I'm upset with, however, is the fact that they felt compelled to do it. They felt compelled to do it because in our society today, you can't put material like that up. This hasn't always been the case. It is now becoming more and more the case. If it's going to be offensive, if people are concerned about it potentially being offensive, rather, they'd rather close it down. And what if impact does that have on the individual artist, person like me? The question comes up as to, I question myself, should I make art of that nature? Should I put it up? The show's closed down. I think it's not time for discussion yet. I'm sure there will be. <laughs> the show is closed down. I will put it up again. I haven't yet. But we are having this discussion today. Thank you for that. Okay. Well, Anielica, um, what was your reaction to Cooley's work? And, and I understand, uh, you know, as a curator, yeah. and your decision to include it in a feminist exhibition. Sorry, are you asking about the show that was taken down or the show that I previously the did? Pre the sure, show you previously did. And why did I include him in yeah. it? Um, so at the time, I was working as a custom framer. And I was organizing uh, shows on the side. And Huli came in, and he had a huge cardboard folder. And he opened it up, and I saw his art for the first time. And it, it struck me. I was, I was definitely taken aback. And, and at the time, I was organizing this show. And I thought, wow, this would be such a great addition to the show. And, um, and yeah, that, that's basically how it happened. And then I invited him, and that was the first time that he displayed his work. Yeah. So could you talk a little bit about why you think that context and intent really do matter in understanding art? Yeah, I mean, in this, in this particular show, it was all revolving around uh, feminism and, and the, the body, whether it be male or, or female. And the artists were both uh, male and female, so it was really interesting to see how the different artists portrayed their, their vision of what this would look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, do you, could you talk a little bit about why you think that viewers uh, really should try to understand the artist and uh, his or her art, even if they find it challenging? Or... Well, I think that's how we learn and how we grow is by asking questions about things that make us feel uncomfortable. Um, obviously, f feeling uncomfortable is not a pleasant feeling, but I think it's important to ask the questions to understand why. Why are we looking at this? Why the person, why the artist made, made this? And um, yeah. So, I mean, do, do artists, I mean, who has a responsibility for educating uh, the public about art and, and the importance of understanding difficult art. Sorry? I'm just asking any of the three. Oh. I mean, implied here is that when people are confronted with difficult art, they really should engage it. 
Uh, well, art is a two-way street. And so you know, who has the responsibility? It, it'd be very difficult to, to say that it's only the artist that has that responsibility. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is the responsibility of many, many people to, to, to come together to create an art show. Right. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, it's not just the Yeah, art. and I think that um, oftentimes people want to put labels on things and yeah. label people as, oh, this artist does that, and he's weird for, for you know, choosing to paint this or do that or, or whatever. Um, so I think that's, that's another thing is people are, they want to label. They want to label various artists and instead of asking those questions. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Tim, in, in the work you developed, um, you had a conception, and the TTC was nervous about that. Uh, really, it was, is it fair to say that your conception was premised on trusting the public, mm -hmm. and the TTC's misgivings were about not trusting the public? Um, and can there be displays of art that are premised on, well, we can't display things if we can't trust the public to react properly? Um, I think um, you're right. Um, at the same time, I think what, what for us maybe is diff different. You mentioned that there's um, today the situation that you rather meet people who are concerned that someone would be concerned rather than someone who is really against it. You know? So in the entire time, uh, we have not spoken to one person who said, I personally will, uh, will not tolerate that this and that is up there. It's always about other people's potentially being offended. And in our case, uh, um, I think it's a very abstract thing. I mean, um, uh, am I censored as an artist? No. Because um, if, it, if you call that an artwork, the, the thing itself is a platform in which other people can do expression. Do we allow them to, do, to express themselves? And we are not talking about artists, we are talking about anyone. Uh, so it's, it's what I find interesting about the situation and why I'm in a way not entirely unhappy about what happened is that I think it, it's like, uh, in our case, it's a, it's a nutshell situation of uh, uh, basically a train company, right, that suddenly has to deal with issues they have not had to deal in the past. You know, suddenly they are responsible about what one person tells other people, you know. Are we, we can transport people from one station to the next, but are we also allowed to transport content one, from one person to the next? And that opens up questions, and I think what we are, we are experiencing is that um, that the TTC uh, is under the impression of having that new uh, responsibility and tries to react to it. And I think that's a very interesting process um, where hopefully um, we will make a learning curve. And, and of course, our conception was to say, let's try it out. Um, is it really, um, in the end, will we find out that Many, many, many people are evil and, and try to, to put up messages to hurt each other or to denounce or to, to hate or whatever. Or maybe we find out first that the number of these people is not so high. Or um, that uh, if we tolerate it, uh, it will go, go down in the long run. Because if I imagine me, let's, let's say, as a 14-year-old and you give me a device where certain things are banned, Man, I would play forever until I find a workaround to, to get myself expressed. And if you have had spam with Viagra, et cetera, you know what I'm talking about. So I think that you have to think more complex about, you know, what, what, what does it do if you say it cannot happen? And how will the public react? And, and hopefully, of course, um, we said maybe we will find out that people on a train station in the end are able to care for themselves. If someone puts something else up, then we can see, oh, it won't stay there longer than 20 seconds, and that it's good, it's done. And problematic, um, I find, is in our case, uh, if, if um, we, we, we are not, we don't even experiment anymore, you know, because I think it's entirely unimportant what really happens in that particular t train station. It only g gains importance by, by being a social experiment. And if, if we don't even dare to, 
to create these situations of exposure, however, and however many safety layers we already have included, then in the end we don't know anymore. And, and the less we know about possible reaction, the more we start guessing. You know, or someone might, and this person would probably, and who but, but, could... But, but, you know, to, to, I, I think what you're describing, I mean, you're a true installation artist. You're not, your art doesn't stop. You're, you're experimenting, and it can, the experiment continues, and if this TTC closes you down, that's the piece of artwork you've created. It's a closed-down piece of art. That's kind of interesting. But you know, it, this, this exchange with the public is very, very important. And I would agree that even a show like the one I was describing that got taken down, that being taken down is a form of, um, of installation or destructive art in itself. But there is that thing that, uh, that's, that's being denied that we have to talk about. And that is that the public itself isn't the one censoring it and isn't the one in this dialogue. Most of the dialogue, most of that exchange you're talking about is occurring at a level where people are in control and they're trying to be social engineers and control society, not at the level where society itself is involved in that experiment. This one even in that point. We seem to close things down before they get to there. Yeah, I mean, I think that was the common element, all the yeah. in two very different cases. Yours the gallery owners and yours the TTC. It's anticipating what might cause a problem and shutting it down so people don't have the ability to engage the art in the first place. Right. I mean, and, and, and as I say, you know, when you're putting on a show, you want people to engage. I said earlier, I mean, um, a curator does as much work to create that engagement as the artist does, because the final activity is what we're after. And if it's not going to happen, there's no experiment. There's no social experiment taking place anyway. But there is, there are people who are engineering this, so it won't happen. So, Anielica, do you have any sense as to whether this climate that is being described mm -hmm. has an effect on artists and on, is there a greater self-censorship? Sure. I think, and maybe I'm wrong here, but I, my feeling is that what's happening north of our border in the States has um, gotten us in Canada a little bit on edge, um, you know, with, you know, Trump and his comments and the Me Too movement. Um, I think definitely, uh, like you said in the beginning, I think there has been an incline in censorship and art. Maybe it's related to that. I, my feeling is that it is. Um, and certainly, I think, I remember the, the next day it was taken down, you called me, and I was, my, I was, my jaw dropped. I was like, oh my god, I can't, I can't believe that this happened, especially when the owners of the gallery had already been exposed to your work previously. So it really was no surprise to them what what your art was about. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, sh that was a big shock for both of us. But the question I'm asking in part, seeing that happen to others, mm -hmm. do you think it's causing artists to self-censor more so that in what general. they try to produce is, or I mean, is that shaping what kind of art is produced in the first place? I now? would be interested, do you, do you feel after that experience that you? Well, you can't, I don't think I can extrapolate from one person's experience uh, very, very well, but uh, the reason I'm interested in talking tonight is to have us have a dialogue so that we begin to ask that question, is it happening? I think you mentioned things that are happening uh, elsewhere in the world and we're mm -hmm. affected by it. I think there is generally a trend toward not offending people. I think a lot of the discussions in universities these days, is that there's a battle now going on between freedom of expression and appropriate expression. At what point do we cross certain boundaries? Who's allowed to speak for certain groups? Why should I, an old white male, be able to, to depict nude women, for example? What right do I have to do that? So the question comes up, oh, you're an old white guy. You're not allowed to do this anymore. That's passe. That art's moved on. Well, I'm just an individual. I didn't check in the morning to see whether I was allowed to get up and do anything. I just did it. Now the question comes is, to, is that happening? And I think we have to agree in our society that those questions are coming forward. And therefore, they, they can be extrapolated to uh, the sense of self-censorship at a number of levels. And that would include whether you have the right to shock. Now I would put it to you that I might have the right to shock as long as I'm coming from the right quarter. But I'm shocking you anyway, and I don't care. I don't, really, I don't care what you 
but you're part of it. The audience responds to the art. And if the audience gets angry with me, that's part of the whole deal. That's fine, and I have to live with that. That's fine. But do I stop myself because the anger becomes so huge that I'm attacked? For example, if, if you accuse somebody of being a racist or a sexist, will that be enough to stop that person from creating his art? The answer may be yes, because the labels are so harsh. And that's what I'm concerned about. And I think that self-censorship does come from that. And I think to be an artist requires a lot of strength of character, maybe a lot of stupidity, too. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tim, do you have uh, any sense of the state of these issues in Europe? Uh, do you have any sense of what, we're, what I think we're seeing here is more censoring? Um, do you see equivalent things happening in Europe uh, with this kind of Imagine if you were putting this in a train, your installation in a train station in Germany. Do you think you would have run into the same kind of concerns that you face with the TTC? Um, yes, possibly. Um, I, th I think I'm not the right person to really uh, compare, like, you know, trends in Europe versus um, North America. Well, but let's just take your particular installation. Yeah. Do you think you could have run into the same kinds of concerns and so on? Yes. Yeah. I, I think there would be um, for the revolution of, of in, in the GDI in 1989. There are like two major monuments they want to make and we were in the, in the competition. And see, we, our proposal was to say um, we will make a memorial uh, in form of a demonstration plaza on which we will, after each demonstration has happened, we will take the slogan of the demonstration and will paint it on the plaza uh, in, uh, in the size of how many people were there. And, um, so, and it was an ongoing thing, so it was like one year would be one circle of these paintings. Um, maybe we can show images later. But there we ran in the same discussion that people said, but what if it's a right-wing demonstration? You know, we will have a right-wing logo on our plaza painted for at least one year before the next round of demonstration comes along. And uh, do we want this to happen? And, and so on. And, and I think there's the same uh, discussion happening. Uh, yes, interaction of the public is nice as long as it does not bring about certain things we don't like. And I think the same is probably with artists. There's, uh, there's a general understanding that um, if you put people in the p position to decide about these mechanisms, they feel obliged to, you know, make sure it doesn't hurt or it doesn't do something wrong. Same story there. Well, we'd like to bring some of you into this discussion. Do <coughs> any of you have questions or comments that you'd like to make on what you've heard? Yes, the hand there. Uh, Ange is going to bring around a microphone. Uh, we're making a podcast of this, which will be up so anyone can see it and so that That's they fine. can hear the questions. Yeah, thanks. I was just wondering what you all feel about trigger warnings and how they might be implemented into controversial art displays as you describe them, and whether you think that they would be necessary even if they could be implemented. Who would like to? Well, uh, I, I think that... Uh, some of the trigger warnings were talked about, Tim, by, in terms of things like jump and so forth, and how they dealt with that. And was it you know, the strong trigger? Yeah. The strong you, trigger. I think the question is more. Yeah. So, for example, for when there's a display of your art, should there be a warning outside as to the kinds of issues that people are going to face? My take on face? it is, I, I think you, I think I'd like to to give you the credit for being a, uh, a thinking person. Why should I, why why should I assume that that you're asking to be, a, to be protected against an, my art. I, 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 I trigger warning uh, that something, some image might affect you. I hope my art affects you. I really do. Uh, what's a trigger warning? Something that might call, come, bring up a memory, bring up a thought, bring up emotion. I'm afraid I can't. No, I'm, I wouldn't even begin to even want to even 
think that that's necessary. In fact, I think it's anti-art. In fact, what do you, I mean, you, you, in fact, I mean, you're actually talking about this. You've got to be going with this one time because, because you know, there's an issue about whether you want to warn the public ahead of time. If you do that, are you not destroying the whole point of the presentation altogether? Yeah, you're kind of giving the viewer a preemptive idea yeah. of, of what they're going to see. And, um, you know, I've, I've had my friends bring their kids to your show yeah. and, you know, they asked me before, like, is it going to be appropriate, you know, for my daughter to see? And I said, absolutely. It's, it's art. And she, she came with her kid and it was, it was great. So I don't, I don't think that, I, I agree with you. I don't think that there should be any warning or, you know, signs on the door or anything like that. I'm, also, I, I'm not sure whether I understand your question right, because uh, there could be warning like um, you are entering a subway station <laughs> and such and such could happen. Uh, maybe you turn around, which is not very practical. And I think that, that, that puts us at, at, a, at the center of an issue here, which, which I'm very interested in, because the way, um, first I have to say I'm very glad that Canada is, is internationally compared very active in trying to combine artworks with new architecture. There's not many countries doing it and that, uh, you know, consequence. Um, however, the expectation is that art, if it goes down in a subway station, is something that will not hurt anyone or is not going to trigger negative thought. And I think triggering, I mean, that's per se uh, the main doubt that many people have. There could be something up there in a language that hurts someone or triggers someone to go into a shock or a, a memory. I don't know. There's almost endless possibility that this could happen. And my personal question is, um, there's a concept of the, the museum space where you say only people go there who decided to go there and, and then there's the idea to say art could also mix with the public which I find personally very interesting mm -hmm. and um, I'm, actually I cannot give a clear answer saying that um, anything sh should be allowed in the public um, but, but I very much like the, co the concept that things mix that, that we have the ability to not only being confronted with art or expression, in my case, I would say it's not art, it's maybe just expression of someone, that there's a chance to be exposed in the public realm and not only in, in rooms where we have entered a door over which there was a big sign only if you are above 21 and blah, have these and that conditions and sign a waiver or whatever, you are allowed to enter. I mean, that's... Um, Mm -hmm. And that has, could also be expanded this discussion about the question of how we, we, are, we are experiencing, I think, in Europe as well as in the US and, and Canada, uh, a wave where a lot of space that used to be private becomes more uh, public, becomes more private, which then entails also a change of the way these spaces are considered, like how, what could happen there and what not. So that's, that's a big issue. So I want to add one more point to that, and that is that the, uh, the trigger warnings are becoming, uh, are, are, are being classified in our society. They've been named and they are now uh, held as somewhat sacred. And I think a lot of that has been linked with institution, the institutionalization of our communication that's taking place. By that I mean uh, people saying that we have to have governance over language. And that would be from either religious leaders or from um, societal leaders like government where they're controlling our language. And then that's being alluded to as, uh, as something which is protecting part of our society. But the question comes as to whether this really does protect anybody. So in Canada, we've got these, these uh, developing laws which are supposedly helping protect people by forbidding certain speech or and it's very very fuzzy and I and I don't think anything what we're, that we're talking about today even comes close to, to to touching those things but I do wish they didn't exist in our society in Canada to be frank because I think that it does not protect ultimately our freedom of expression which therefore does not protect us at all because something can be limited because we can be governed by institutions like religion or universities or government government other questions
Yes, in back. Okay. Hi, guys. Um, I guess my question is, um, what is the intent of your art? Like, what do you want the viewer, what's the message you want to send to the viewer? Because, yeah, where does a limit exist, you know? Like, you're talking about um, different institutions, religions, and things like that, but government does have some control. Like, for example, child pornography, would that be considered art? Would that not require some sort of, like, trigger warning? Or, like, wh where's the limit, you know? So well, Anielka, uh, with, you, with your photography, what, yeah. what do you, what's the objective of your photography? Is that the question you're asking? Yeah, what's the objective? Yeah. For me, the objective is to portray the subject, and I shoot people in environments, um, in a very honest way. And I think that's the, the, rev the reviews I get from people that look at my work, that's what they say, is it feels like a very authentic, freeing uh, photograph of, of the person. You know, there's not, like, you know, intense makeup or poses. They're often nude. And... Sorry, I, I have not really familiar with your work. Can you give me an example of something that someone might find offensive in, with your work? To be honest, no one has found anything I've done offensive, except for Instagram. So, like, <laughs> you, Instagram, you post something that's the tiniest bit you know, revealing something, and within seconds, somebody flags it, and it's down. And that has been an issue, I think, for, like, I represent uh, directors and photographers, and that has been something that photographers have struggled with on social media, sharing, being able to share, because you know, social media is such an amazing outlet for mm -hmm. artists. And, um, and the shareability has, has been stopped, almost, by, you know, so People don't flagging. you think you guys as artists have a certain responsibility as well, which comes with that? There's Absolutely. The, there is obviously freedom of speech, but yes. for example, for Huli, sorry, is yep. that right? For your work, um, like Abrahamic religions and, and depicting Mary, peace be upon her, in a very, you know, seductive, whatever way, that is like almost like a direct hit, you know what I mean? If someone who is quite religious. Um, so is the intent, intent there to like just shock the society or like why that that does elicit a negative response in many people who would be let's say religious well, well, the, you know, no question. Well, the, the first thing is every show that I've solo show that I've curated with Huli um, when I first started working with him the most important thing that I really want to incorporate in the shows is an artist statement which is printed right when you walk in and it's huge and it's printed onto the wall and that for me is is very important when it comes to Huli's art because Without that, there's no, you know, if, if we weren't in the gallery to, to talk to the viewers coming in and, and have that voice, at least there's something there that sort of... Explain, is it like a trigger thing or is uh, it... What no, you, it's no? not. It, it, talks about, uh, it talks about female agency, mm -hmm. uh, which is very important uh, in the presentation of, of, the, of, the, of the work, where you've got the understanding that the, these are, they have personalities and the personalities are reading forward. The intent, the overall intent, is to have something extremely beautiful that uh, lures you in, and then as you look at it, you realize what you're looking at, and you realize you've got this um, this this polarized uh, reaction where you're attracted to the beauty, and you're shattered by the message that this beautiful thing is also taboo, and it's breaking down something, and it reveals something inside you that you are afraid to admit. Uh, so it's, got, it's the essence of erotica in that you are titillated by it, but you don't want to be. And, uh, and so for the person who's very religious, uh, my, my understanding, my, my interpretation is, as an artist is that if you are a follower of one of the Abrahamic religions, that is uh, Judaism, Christianity, or, or um, is, uh, Islam, you, are, you, you understand that the female, the female body is extremely important and you want to hold it as something sacred, you don't want it to break down and, re and, and shatter your illusions, and yet at the same time you're attracted to it and you don't want to be. So oh, I don't think it's the, the female body, I think modesty is across all those religions, right? Male yeah, no, or female, but, I, but, but in society I I'm understand. I'm going to target the female body because I do believe that's where it lies. And I think uh, in terms of um, your other question was, are there limits to it? Mm -hmm. um, in the history of art, there are no limits. Uh, I will draw attention to the fact that uh, Balthus's work, um, 
Therese Dreaming at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York had a protest against it in December 2017, and uh, that uh, the, the Met decided not to bring it down. Uh, that, that, that protest continues there, and so the question comes down to, if it's depicting children, because this one does, yeah. okay. if it's depicting uh, a child, is it therefore to be banned? Well, in the case of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, they have not taken down Bautus's work. It was released, it, he painted it in the 1930s. There were problems even then, but people don't. So then the question comes up, well, if it's artistic enough, it's okay, is it? My question will be, well... What defines does, artistic enough about yeah, child pornography? And I think that this is the debate, and I do believe artists have the right to, to, to pursue these things. Do they have a responsibility, is your question? Yeah, they have a responsibility to challenge the society. That's their responsibility. Responsibility is not to be good. So the intent of the message doesn't have, you were saying, always have to be positive, even if it is negative towards certain viewers, it's okay. Yes. So, okay, so even things that might make you uncomfortable would be okay, you think? Yes. In, interesting. Okay, interesting. another question. Uh, <coughs> Daniel? Hi. Oh. Um, so I would like to know, why do you believe that a permanent public installation in an active transit station is the right venue for a social experiment? I guess it's a question to me. Yes. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, I want to be uh, totally honest. Um, we, are, we are in an art group and we do um, various installations across various topics from environmental issues, um, public space. Uh, there are a few works also which have uh, deal somehow with um, allowing other people than myself actually to, to express themselves. So I think that's actually mix, mixing the, the realm of art with the realm of being maybe a curator of other people's expression. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say that every a subway station should be a place for um, for that form of experiment. Um, at the same time, um, uh, it, it was an idea that um, it, um, it's not like a formula where I can prove like, you know, all the bits who are substantially uh, sit on each other and form the bigger picture. It's also a collage of, of images. And um, I think it was just our understanding that a subway station is a place where people have a certain, like a transit uh, situation. Most of them don't stay there very long. So it's... Uh, hopefully. Uh, uh, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so it's, it's a, a transit space which, which, have, um, with, which has a certain homogeneous character in its, in its like flow, I would say. And we thought it's interesting to use that space for a very modest social experiment. And, and let me tell you again, like 10 years ago, uh, the concerns about um, interactivity, and I'm, I work in the field of interactivity for a long time, and I'm, I've, I'm a fierce uh, critic of interactivity because I think most of it um, is just a disguise for artists not knowing what they want to do themselves. Um, and, and it always has really the problem that, or back then we felt so much that there's so, many, so much interactive stuff out there which uh, ex uh, creates nothing but rubbish and nonsense. And it's very, very depressing uh, to have an installation which only exposes that, you know, we are all dumb and uh, um, non-feeling, etc. And I think that was my biggest fear. And it was a long process that we designed a mechanism where we felt maybe that's the right mechanism to n not just enlarge the bad side in us, but also to give us, put us in a positive, competitive environment. Actually, I'm gl quite glad that the outcome that we have 10 years later by installation being banned and also by a much bigger uh, discussion suddenly being in place about this, the responsibility of social media, etc. I think um, uh, we are just lucky that we found um, that's a total valid question. You know, what is going on in a public space and what is what is under the control of, of the mechanisms. I think you should, should see the bigger pictures we are in. There are more and more ways of our uh, communication 
things just wandering into these technical realms. So I could say, for instance, when I put, take my telephone and we talk on the telephone, I know that the telephone companies have the technical um, ability to listen into what we are talking about. And isn't it their obligation that if I want to say something offensive to you, it would not reach you? These are the questions we are entering, and I think they're just scratching that surface. And we are going in a direction where we are more and more in these technical realms where the subway station is about the most primitive form of a technical realm I could think of, probably, in the long run, cyberspace, etc. And I think these are very valid questions today to put ourselves in experimental situation to try out what's happening and how can we maybe get it control away from the larger entities back down on the platform, so to speak, between each other. I think that was our driving motive, and uh, I want to repeat, not a every uh, subway station should be that experiment, I think, but at the same time, I think those exper experiments should be in a public realm. For instance, in a subway station. If they don't like it and they want to sell it, maybe we find a bit n another space which won't be a um, subway station. Daniel? Hi. Yeah, I, thanks a lot for these uh, provocations. I, um, I'm also an artist, and uh, I just made some notes. That I, this, I keep this sort of a little bit structured. Uh, I'm also interested in provocation. I've also uh, gotten in trouble for it, been either uh, uh, censored or at least censured for it. And I mean, I, I want to sort of raise the possibility that this conversation is happening uh, without any discussion at all of the structures of power that we make art within. Um, and I, I want to offer a reading that you can either take or leave. I don't think that the two situations we're looking at here are, are in most respects alike. Um, the one thing that is common to both, I think it's awful that you uh, had institutions make commitments to you and then withdraw. I think that's repre it's reprehensible. Um, but I think like one main difference to we should be talking about here is that these are not both the same kinds of spaces. One is an elective space, the other is a non-elective space. Um, you are obliged, you may be obliged, depending on your social economic position, to occupy a public transit hub. You are not ever obliged, unless you know, you're in some weird hostage situation, to occupy, occupy a gallery cafe space. Uh, a telephone call, likewise, to your last point, is an elective space. The reason that you know, the state should not be free to intervene there is because they're intervening in a, in a consensual elective space, right? I mean, a public transit hub is, a public transit hub is not the same thing. Um, and I find uh, it baffling that, we are, that it's, it's hard to think of what could appear in 10 characters that might be uh, in, intensely upsetting to people who uh, do not ultimately have a choice given, you know, sort of economic coercion to be in that space. I can think of a six-letter word for black people. I can think of a four-letter word for Jews. Uh, you know, and I do think that there is a public interest, or there's a, an argument to be made that there's a public interest um, in not, if people are compulsorily occupying those spaces, in a sense, that they should not be obliged to see that, uh, given that the, the histories of violence and the structures of power that they uh, live in. So, uh, but I think all this is kind of uh, superficial. Basically, the, the, more basically, the issue that I, I want to speak to is, why is the work shocking? You know, and I think that in, in both cases, the work is shocking because it's throwing punches, right? It's, it's, it's sort of, or it has the potential in one case to throw punches, in the other case it's throwing punches. And, uh, you know, it's punching at something fr at fragile targets, and I think that there's a distinction to be made between legitimate and illegitimate targets. So in the one case where you have people non-consensually uh, non occupying or, or uh, compulsorily occupying a public space, um, if they are the objects of, you know, verbal attacks that are di displayed on a screen, I don't think that's an acceptable target. On the other hand, uh, in your work, Huli, if the, the target of the attack are institutions like religion, like the church, patriarchal institutions that are, are themselves have done so much violence, um, I think those are perfectly acceptable targets to be attacking in your work. If, if the, the provocation is about sort of challenging those sorts of holy cows, I think that's a totally acceptable uh, target. Um, and I think it's, it's really embarrassing that that kind of anti-clerical, anti-patriarchal fervor is not celebrated now, that you don't have other artists outside the gallery picketing on your behalf. 
um, because you know, like th those issues that you're dealing with in an attack on institutions are now being dealt with in very sort of narrowly neoliberalized and individualized ways. So we can talk about patriarchy in the courtroom, but we can't talk about patriarchy in the church, right? Uh, so anyway, uh, that's not a, that's a, a classic comment, not a question, but I think that there are important <laughs> distinctions to be made here without which we're not really talking about anything. Thanks. Thank you. So, comments? Anyalika, do you want to? Yeah, that was great. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, well, I, I, I do point out that, that basically I think that Tim's the one who's got a comment because what he's saying is that you're trapping people effectively in a place they have no choice, choice but to be. And, you're, and you're, 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 your artwork, your social experiment is effectively setting up the possibility that they're going to see a six-letter word for black people in your ten characters that's going to offend them. And they have no choice but they have to use that subway station. So it's not the same thing as going to a gallery where you're expecting to see art. That's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is, 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 however, is society to, again, it comes down to should we protect everybody from this activity? Do we live in a society where this can't happen? We must make sure it never happens. You never see that word. And uh, if somebody happens to create it in this, this experimental art piece, it would limit the, pr pr the production of public art to such a degree, if you think this through, that it becomes quite frightening as to what we'd have to think through ahead of time before putting something up. I don't know if it's, if it's fair to, to, to say that art in a public space has to have, has to have that much um, uh, censorship. It's basically what you're saying. It's a different kind of animal. It's in a public space where people have to be. Therefore, you have to be careful, really, really careful. Is that fair to say the public has to be protected against itself to such a degree we can't trust people? can't trust people to actually experience things like expression that might occur in a, and the communication that could have come from some other person using the subway. Tim, do you have a comment? Yeah, I, th I think um, from what you say, um, maybe I should be more clear about what our interest is. Um, um, I come from the realm of architecture, and um, I, we do have one project which is like an ongoing project for 20 years almost now, which is about creating public space in Berlin. And um, it's um, uh, funnily, it, it, uh, it's attached to a, the very first garden that was, or, no, park, a, a small piece of greenery inside the city next to the castle, so which was at a time where the emperor allowed um, the public to gather outside the castle which was a large experiment. And uh, f for me, it, it's striking for the project we right now are trying to do is to, to use one side of that garden and say it access now a river, and people can also swim in the river. And, and so all the complaints come. This and that could happen, and people might not behave and be drunk, etc. And I think um, <clears throat> the, the picture we are in is, yes, you can say a, a public space is defined by the total absence of any danger, mentally, physically, etc. But you can also say a public space is a space of potential danger, maybe on a limited scale. And as I would say what, what, what the power of cities is and, and what, what public space in a, in a, as a bigger meaning has made important is that there's a certain amount of exposure to, to new ideas which is vital to society. Uh, that is why I'm skeptical about like a suburban society because it has as a power to limit all, you know, negative triggering inputs altogether. And I think that's the question we are asking. I mean, the TTC, just to give one example of probably the coming 10,000 of them, the TTC today can easily scan all the people when they enter the station and decide who could be harmful or triggering? What are they wearing? What are the prints on their t-shirt? And isn't that their obligation to bar your entry point when you have a four-letter word on your t-shirt? I mean, I'm not saying yes or no, but I'm saying we are in a world where we are silently shifting more and more social skills. That, Like, why aren't we violently in this room? Because we have some pattern of behavior that allows us to be nice. 
And we are more and more shifting these uh, social patterns into machineries and, and highly uh, technical spaces. And, and by the time we do it, there's an engineer in the room, a lawyer comes in the room, and all these people now try to make uh, the decisions what uh, we can all do on ourselves, like what are the rules and by what have we to um, prevent by all means. And I'm, I'm just curious about how we will work with that. And as I, I can only repeat, I'm not saying all subway stations in the future will have this stupid chain of chandeliers <laughs> where, we, where we can write four letter, um, letters at each other, but I think we need to have experiments which make us aware what we are entering, what, what world, and, and, and I think there should be a certain risk, yes. And actually, maybe you drive up there. Um, um, I mean, I have children, they're 13 and 15, and most time they spend is trying to make language as aggressive and harmful as possible if they're in their group. <laughs> and I think, it's, you know, there's, there's so much going on with ourselves testing, especially when we are young. Uh, to, to also use language in a certain way and I think also being a bit robust against language and also being robust against uh, chandeliers which are three meters uh, large where you actually have almost to lay down on the station to even read it. Um, I don't see the big risk, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay there and then are you keeping track? There are several people, there's one in the back and all over the room. There's about eight, six hands that went up so. Okay, go ahead. All right. Um, so I find this talk very interesting, the idea that censorship doesn't have to be necessary um, or that it can even be detrimental to like, the, like expressing ideas and asking questions. Um, I would also agree that like, you need to ask questions. Those questions, like, that art has this potential to expand minds <coughs> by shocking. Um, so I guess my question to you is, with our art installations, um, since it's in the public's hands and anyone can really say anything, do you think that <coughs> there's a possibility that people can collectively shift, I guess, public thought to be more positive? Because there's always the question of, is it going to become more negative? But do you think there could be more positivity built from public installations as well? Is that the end goal, I guess, of these? Or is it just to see where the mind's eye is, or the public's eye is? You mean, is my point trying to prove only that we are not dangerous? Yeah, no, yes, of course, I want more. I mean, uh, obviously, you're putting things up. As, as we open <coughs> a, a, a medium to expression, the idea always is that expression, in the end, turns out positive. And, um, I mean, there, there are, probably there's a lot, lot of um, garbage to be displayed. Um, but, but my hope also is that maybe if, if, if there is something thoughtful, that it stays longer than things which are thoughtless, and, and that um, people encourage each other to um, rather um, compete in a positive way rather than just being destructive. Um, um, a lot of the discussion here tonight has been about uh, self-censorship and social censorship. Um, but I thought perhaps it would be interesting to address where these norms come from. Uh, Theodore Dorno talked about the idea of the culture industry and cultural institutions being massive bureaus of information. And I was curious why there was no one from the, from the public art institutions here tonight. Because when we think of censorship, we think of something more establishment, something more authority, you know, an authority, rather than just us sort of deciding what we feel comfortable with. It seems to be more of a discussion of taste here tonight. Um, was anyone from the from the AGO or from such like invited no, to be here? No. no. Okay. Was there a reason for that? No. I mean, we thought it was going to be an opportunity for artists to talk about what they experience and both self-censorship, and that was the, the thought behind it. Although we do have certainly an example of a major institution, i.e. the TTC, acting as a censor. That's not fair. Not a cultural institution. Well, no. it's not a cultural institution at all. No. 
uh, it all depends on what you mean by cultural institution. Uh, you missed the, I, I, maybe you did come to the, 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 the panel last year where there were a number of representatives from Canada Council and, yeah, and others, another, and it, they did discuss right. this, and uh, I, I found it very offensive at being in the audience listening to them because they, they, their attitude was very much what you're talking about, which was that we've moved on and that there's no room today for uh, the type of thing that we're talking about today, where you can uh, express things which can be offensive. Their attitude much more was that artists have a responsibility to care for society and care for the voices of people that have long been eclipsed. And therefore, we've, we've moved on to the point where you don't have and things like appropriation of voice to be, to be understood as being the normal development now. So effectively, they, in my mind, were celebrating uh, institutional censorship and saying that it was creating a better Canadian society. Now, that's my take on it. Uh, I, you were there. You know, I, I remember uh, it, being in the audience and being really, really upset by their attitude. Um, so in a way, it would have been kind of nice to have those two panels meet each other. That would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, having panels with six speakers means we either go all night or we flip around so much. Or so. throwing baseballs at each other. Yeah. Like so we Dodgeball. do things sequentially. <laughs> Sheila. Um, so, I mean, we seem to be, as a society, really great at, you know, condemning and shutting things down and when we don't like something. Um, as artists, do you ever experience uh, support uh, for when things like that start to happen? And I'm thinking of the... Um, I was so disappointed with the the, um, the subway installation being delayed or stalled, and I thought when I read about it, I thought how exciting this is uh, to have something like this in Toronto. It's a, it's it, it is a risk for the TTC. It is a risk, and it's so exciting. And I don't feel that we, as the public, really had a chance to condemn it or support it. And so I'm interested in your thoughts on what kinds of supports do you get to counter you know, people wanting to stop your work or object to your work? Are there things that we could be doing better? And maybe, Jim, you could even chime in on that in terms of what Ryerson is doing and how we can have a groundswell of, let's try this out, let's not shut these things down. So, Tim, there's a lot of coverage over the TTC yeah. this in Toronto. Uh, Star had big articles and so on. Did you get any feedback from anybody? Yeah, I mean, um, there has been like media coverage which was um, mostly a uh, bit critical about um, this issue of it, it not being uh, opened or even the TTC censoring, although I would personally object to the term that the TTC is a censor here. Um, but I would say, I'm, um, you said it, um, it was exciting and it was shut down. Personally, for me, it, right now it still is exciting because I'm also what happens, like talking about this, uh, about the situation is probably um, valuable. Um, I think um, ideally we will have this phase of, I would say, crisis, but this, it's a positive crisis and there will be an outcome that uh, the installation will go online and, and, you know, can do what it was intended to do. And um, so, so I'm, I'm not very negative right now. Um, I think the, the most negative form is to turn it on and um, it, it remains unnoticed and only creates uh, rubbish all the time. That would oh, I guess that's the advantage of a huge installation. They can't just throw it in the wastebasket or make it disappear. That's, that's, that's a good thing. They couldn't just take it down because then it would be well, embarrassing well, for they, them. They, 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 they would they, have, they, they had their, their investment, uh, $500,000 investment. They're, yeah. not, they're thinking they could turn it into a nice chandelier maybe, but that's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, but but, but, but there's the, an interesting point that's brought up about what can be done. This house of counterpoint is that if art doesn't cause this type of a problem, is our artists really doing their their work. I mean, if, if, so if, if everything's, everything's comfortable um, and people are positive and making sure things work out, it's it just, that's, I guess, you, you, you brought up maybe the essential point. What are we complaining about anyway? I mean, if we didn't have these battles, would there be anything worthwhile in art? I mean, really. It's only, it's only, only really happening if people are, if you're confronting the edge of people's tastes, I think. And it's not just that we're talking about taste, by the way. We're not just talking about taste. We're talking about society's acceptance of art, which is which, 
which does dictate to some extent all those institutions you say should be represented here. They do that, and they, so it, it, it all, what comes around goes around. It's, it's all connected, I think. Others have seen a number of hands. Yep. Ange up here. Sorry, there. Oh, we've got somebody there. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, a question if you could speak to maybe a distinction between uh, the TTC, T, TTC's objection to the piece from the perspective of legal peril, uh, shouting jump in a crowded room and someone jumps onto the platform or, or uh, yelling fire in a, in a theater. That's one kind of danger posed by that signage, that, that piece. Then there's the other dimension of the piece where um, it's an amplifier and a mirror of the people who are occupying that station. I could just as easily shout something on a station platform at a group of people that someone might find offensive. Yet the piece is, in a sense, a kind of amplification of who I am, even if it is only up there for an instant, even if it is something that most people would miss because it's ephemeral. And my occupation of that space is largely ephemeral. There's two, seems to me, two very different kinds of um, offense, if you can call it that, that the piece offers. One is a legal one, which could be remedied some other way. And the other one is, is, um, is art allowed to engage the public in a public space? Mm. Mm. <laughs> that was not a question. It was an observation, right? It's an observation and a question. The TTC has gone out of its way to commission artists to animate its spaces, yet it picked your project knowing that it would be engaging the public. So with that comes a kind of burden, and that burden would be to acknowledge that the public is the public and they will do what they do. So what remedies are there um, for, that, for that if that's a problem? I don't know whether I get the question right. I mean, um, I, I, in the beginning, I explained that right now we are, we are in a process of discussing certain mechanisms that would then uh, effectively uh, create a blacklist in the long run by terms being uh, complained about. Uh, the TTC looks at these things and um, gives the question to someone who uh, c can make the understanding what, what means hate speech, what has to be legally uh, kept out, and, and what is the obligation of the TTC. Um, so there, and that way, yes, there is a mechanism that is planned. Uh, and, so and if, I, if I understand what you're saying, the, any word on that list if somebody entered it wouldn't show. Yeah, it, once once it, it's made clear that this word uh, must not appear because it uh, constitutes hate speech, for instance. Well, I'm not sure there's any word that can constitute hate speech I know, in Canada. But, but there may be words that are hateful that the uh, TTC wants to avoid. No, no, but... You would have to test it out to find out. Yeah, no, no, but I, in terms of what courts treat as hate speech, I'm not sure right. a word can qualify. Ten characters. Ten characters can qualify. But that is a may. There are plenty of words that are deeply offensive. Daniel referred to some of them. Uh, that are deeply offensive, even if it's not illegal to say them, uh, that the TCC may not want to appear. So what you're saying is they'd be on a list, and if somebody entered those characters, that string of characters, it just wouldn't come up on the screen. Yeah, but our, our point of view is that the TTC should draw a line between things they, they are, where it's their legal obligation that these things do not appear, because they are um, like hate speech, um, it must be prevented. Uh, and other things which are just tasteless or offensive as such, where we'd say that is something we want to see and be seen uh, dealt with on the platform level, if you, if you will, right? So what you're saying is you'd be agreeable to things being on the blacklist if they were illegal, illegal but not yes. if they are tasteless or hateful but not illegal. Exactly. But there's nothing uh, illegal. Pardon me? Is there are no words that are illegal. I'm not sure there are any words. Dick, do you have any thoughts on this? I hate to put you on the spot. Pardon me? Okay. No, oh, no, but I mean, that's an interesting question. Are there words that could be illegal? Well, we understand. Sorry. Do you want to give Dick a mic? In oh, yeah, yeah. I'll give you back. Maybe it's. Okay, thanks. I had not intended speaking, but okay. <laughs> I mean, I think we understand hate speech in, in two ways. Sometimes we understand it as speech that is in, seeks to persuade the members of you know, the dominant community how they should view or think about others. But I think we also understand it 
uh, as occurring when there are words that can be understood as threatening in character. And many of the words referred to you know, can carry that meaning with them. And whether or not it falls in the category of hate speech or not comes awfully close, and I think there could be legitimate concerns. As we talked about in free speech, we, we talk about the captive audience, the difference between the location where one can choose to be there and where one has no real meaningful choice. And I think it does, it does matter. I think the only thing, other thing I would say is I understand this project began prior to a time in which we've come to realize that comment sections in newspapers, for example, or online, are deeply troubling. And I believe it's at the CBC that just stopped, or maybe it's the Globe and Mail, uh, allowing comments on stories about indigenous, indigenous stories, indigenous people, simply because of the kind of bile and the hatred that was being spewed out in those locations. So I get the idea of risk, I get it, but also maybe what's being pursued is a reasonable compromise here. Um. If I may react directly, I think that's one of the discussions I find interesting which are in there. For instance, the, the, um, the, there's a phenomenon of the abstract uh, electronic space where people feel encouraged to, to say out loud what they privately maybe wouldn't. And I think that's one part of the experiment of what I'm interested in because we have a, a real social space. You know, there are people and if you type things on the, on the display, you are under observation by other people. So it's not that total abstract thing that you cannot, you know, text something there and, and being hidden. It, you have to expose yourself, step up and type it. And, and that's, I think, a very interesting thing for us to see. Is it still so dangerous? Uh, and, you know, like, what is the difference between the electronic space and the real space? At the same time, I maybe even forgot to mention, of course, the TTC will aim a camera at each of these uh, terminals and there will be a big sign saying like, you are under observation. So you would actually ask yourself, what I'm typing here, is it possibly illegal? Could I be persecuted? I mean, actually, I find the situation super strongly under supervision, so socially in that case, that I'm not so much concerned that it goes so totally uh, through the ceiling as, as in, in Facebook or... So it's not like the anonymity of, of the social media. But what you're describing is terrifying. Uh, <laughs> you're describing a horrendous situation where people are going to be intimidated into not speaking. And if I may just comment on this thing, comp compromise, use the word compromise. You could easily extend that to art galleries, especially publicly funded ones, and say, well... well I agree with the earlier No, but, yes, but, but you could easily... a distinction between a public space... Yes, but a publicly funded art gallery could easily be, be, be called, called out for this. And you're saying compromise. I think compromise is the enemy of art. I do not think that the word compromise should ever be used when you're talking about the creation of something it, where... You, if you have to worry about compromise. You, you're not talking about art anymore. You're talking about social, ex social engineering, social control. Yeah. I think we're about yeah. No, I don't well, think well, we are. Well, well, folks. I think it's because it, a public gallery, after all, is a place where art takes place, and that, and, and you would not, you, you can't, you can't, you can't just say it only applies to a space like a TTC station. Well, yeah, Claire. Yeah, the distinction, Daniel, draw the distinction that you drew initially, because I think that's what's... Yes, but just to, sorry, like, the conditions of policing and surveillance you were describing, the dystopian conditions you were describing, already exist. They exist in the TTC, they just don't exist for white people, okay? The idea that the corporation is policing the space to make it ideally safe, no. It's policing it to limit their liability. It is... It, the, the TTC is engaged already in creating the danger that you're saying that it's trying to eliminate, right? When the TTC like broadcasts that if you see something, say something, warnings, it is hailing white users to surveil as amateur cops, they're black and brown and queer and trans, et cetera, peers, right? So 
you know, I, I just like, I'm sorry, I, I just really wanted to respond to that. I'm not going to take time. But this, like, this <laughs> idealization of, of pure expression is false because we all know, I think, in the room, that if the TTC were, you know, sort of uh, going to put up a martyr photo from, uh, from an ISIS fighter with Arabic scrawl on the wall, we, it, would, it would just be obvious to us that this would be like maybe a weird thing to do in the space because it would, you know, be like harmful to people in the space. Uh, you know, I just think like, <laughs> It's not uh, a, a super provocative claim or even a censorious claim to suggest that one might want to balance the principle of expression, which is a very important principle from the left, from the socialist left as much as anything else, with the likely political impact of the art. Okay, we're, now we're going, but just before we come back to your comment, what the debate that was going on before was whether there was the distinction that you initially drew between public spaces where people are there, not by choice, but you have to go through the TTC station to go on the TTC, as opposed to public spaces like the AGO, which you go there by choice. I think that was a distinction. Just first foremost, I mean, I don't get to go and spray paint on your, on your, your artwork. That would be an interference with your work of art. No, it would be a continuation of the art. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So. Wait, wait, wait. Can can Ange bring you the microphone? Just, just. Yeah. No, we will just let people hear that. Then we'll. Many people wanting to talk, I take as a good sign. These events that don't work is what I try to pull uh, 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 an animator talk. Just those, so could those, you repeat what you were just saying? Just those, 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 there was two points there. We talk about public art. And uh, these artists here have gone through a process to get their art in a space. I know this also an artist. I have a lot of artwork out there, and some of which has a keyboard on it where people can make their own comments there. And some of the comments are a little bit vile and rude. And the people, and it's a public place, the people who uh, take care of this piece of art vet that keyboard. But people read it, and people figure it out, and they don't get offended, or if they do get offended, it's not something they're bringing up to, onto the world stage. So people do their own censoring. So your art, which puts it onto a very large scale, mine is a public piece of art, it's in a very public place, and it has a keyboard where people can put their own comments on there. So this is already being done, and the institution, public institution, allows it to happen. Now, something uh, to, uh, as re regards to uh, Hula's art, which I have seen. You can walk into the Sistine Chapel, you can look upstairs, and you can look at uh, Ad uh, Adam's not very inspiring penis, and also the penises of the little cherubs, which are uh, gathered around, uh, around God there. That could be considered art of nudist, nude art of children, which it really is. But we go to the Sistine Chapel and we look up in awe at it. This is what art is. You can't start censoring one thing or another. I could be a graffiti artist and put something nasty on the wall. Who's going to vet me? I'm gone. I'm a shadow in the night. We have pictures of Banks' art right now. Uh, here's a graffiti artist. He started to ask questions. Are we going to start uh, vetting uh, Banks' art? Who's going to be the arbiter of the censorship here? You know, we're adults. We've grown up in, in, in this society. Surely we can decide whether we want to see something or we don't want to see it whether we want our children to see it or we don't want to see it. Or if we do see something, and I've been to the Holocaust Memorial in, Jeru in, uh, in Jerusalem, and there is some very, very nasty and provocative Nazi art, but I saw it. Why? Because I want to know it was there. I want to know a reminder it was there. It should not be forgotten. So it's the same thing with any of our art. Why are we censoring it? If you don't like it, don't go and see it. Okay, now there's a long list of speakers. Um, who's next? Okay. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. No, 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 it's here. Take your chance. <laughs> um, I, I think there also in a public space needs to be a sensitivity to experiences that aren't our own, particularly if we're coming from a privileged, visibly privileged group, um, because Toronto is an incredibly diverse range of different people, come refugees, um, people who have experienced extreme physical and psychological abuse. And in a free society, I mean, freedom for or freedom to can only come with freedom from, freedom from fear, freedom from persecution. And when certain forms of art are broadcast in public spaces, 
there can be the impression that they're also sanctioned, I think, by the society which is representing them, allowing them to be represented. So my, my two bits. Any comments? Did you ever come in? No, no I, I agree. I don't agree. Really? I, I don't understand the question totally. Were you just directing it at the TTC station at this time? It, it was more of a, a comment. It wasn't a question. It sounded more like a general comment about yeah. privilege. And yeah. uh, so that sounds like it's so, yeah, it sounds like you're saying that we should be thoughtful and, and care about everybody around us when we produce our art. Well, it's very easy to say, I don't care if people are offended, when you're not the one being offended. But, but, but... So I think there needs to be a sense so, that so, each of us has a very narrow worldview. Yes, we do. World view. We do. And I think in light of that, particularly within the multicultural, diverse society in which we're living, yeah. in public spaces, I think there needs to be a careful attention and awareness uh -huh. of experiences which, uh, and we're talking about experiences which none of us can Again, you've come back to the, the, pu the public them. spaces. Uh, okay, so, so notwithstanding the graffiti artists that you can't catch at night and all that kind of thing, sure. But, but, and, but still, your, your comment kind of has, the, has enough fuzziness around it that it kind of extends as a challenge to all artists, I think, to some extent. I'm talking within the spectrum of private to public. There's a difference between what you can make and show in the privacy of your bedroom okay. than what you allow to be shown in a public. So by, by I'm not sure what you mean by public, because public can mean anywhere then, anything outside your bedroom. No, like public is, is a place which is funded by taxpayer money and which, as the fellow back there noted, is, is an un you have no choice. I have to go to work. I don't want to go through a subway station. So you don't include an art gallery. An art gallery doesn't get covered by your, your prescriptions. An art gallery is not covered by your prescriptions. Yeah, that's right. And it, again, it depends on the art gallery. Uh, yeah. Okay, but the worry I have is that you have a society which is being, uh, which is being controlled by people having to self-censor themselves and be very careful about others. And I was a white, old white male who have to consider my, my privilege and therefore should check myself. But, In certain areas, yeah. Why? Okay. We're because not because because, okay. because society was a, because society is a, is the shared commons. But you know what? You don't. It may be in general. That's like macroeconomics within microeconomics. I'm sorry. You, each person does not wake up and do a little checklist of whether they're they're doing all the correct things each day. That doesn't work like that. You know. It may be in general. You hope society goes in that way. Frankly, I think it's leading to more censorship. I think it's a terrible society that expects everybody to be good all the time and be worried about whether they're offending people. Okay. Next. I'm sure this discussion Hi. will continue. Let's give um, a few more I'm people. I'm wondering ask because there, or there's sort of a difference between how um, how uh, censorship affects art when it's um, being represented. Uh, de depicted visually or uh, versus text, um, and similarly, where you display your art, you have um, different levels of some censorship as well. Um, as artists, do you ever not censorship yourself in a way that affects the message that you want to get across with your art? But but do you ever, uh, I, g I guess, use a different medium uh, and maybe appropriate venue sort of considerations when you're trying to get across specific points? Like, would you say that you would censor yourself, yourself in, like, would there be a place where you wouldn't want to display your art it, in an inappropriate place? Well, or whether yeah. you would, 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 would you censor sure. yourself that way? Yeah, maybe. I, I think, and maybe, 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 yeah. maybe kindergartens or something? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think, I think for sure, having curated a bunch of Hooli's shows, we are very selective of where the locations in which he, he showcases his work. Yeah, but it's a good question. Is that censorship or is that just good business sense? I don't know. Okay, I think you're aware, yeah, though. Yeah, you're is there aware. anybody, who has, you're aware. Is there anybody yeah, who hasn't aware. asked a question or made a comment who would like to before we go to the second round? Okay. Yeah. It's just a very quick point because um, a lot of people have been, bring, have been bringing up the idea of if it's in a public place and I see it, 
it's sort of like assaulting me. I can't like I can't put it push it away. Um, but there's an interesting point with the the little console where you can type in it. If I see that and I say I don't want that in my public space, I have the agency to walk up to it and assert myself and assert my views. And and maybe my views are I don't want this. I want something else. And I think that's very powerful. I think people can do a lot of good and. If there's a negative word that's up for an instant, yeah, it was there. And you know, there's a lot of nasty undersides of our society, and yeah, they're there. And that kind of almost says, yeah, like we can't always avoid it. But if someone s changes it in a second, like I think that says something too, and I think that's powerful. And yeah, it's more of a comment, not a question. But yeah, <laughs> I think that if, even if like it's public, but yes, but people can say things, and you can. Have a choice too. I think that's really that's interesting. Sort of consistent cool. with the conception you had. I'm trying not to get confused myself. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, of course, I mean that's that's basically our simple formula um, of uh, inside this nutshell experiment inside the public. And um, so um, m maybe our view was um, let's start with it and observe it and see what happens next and. Um, um, in general, from the comments I get here, um, I think there are basically two sides here. Uh, and um, I think, in a way, we are also not really happily in between, because um, one big question is, is that equal the expression of anyone on a display, you know, um, and an artwork, you know? It's also a very vicious question, you know, are all people equal in their right to express themselves? But uh, let, for the time being, we say everyone's stepping up there and typing as an artist. But um, I think the, um, what I get from the room is that, that the concerns is either uh, there has to be freedom and there has to be protection. <laughs> and, and, my, and there are even people who uh, in one statement say the one and then they say the opposite. And uh, my, my understanding is that um, and what I'm very happy about is that I think it shows already that these simple views do not cover it all. You know, there's there's something happening here, and um, I, again, I want to stress the point. I think the simple understanding, saying public space is what taxpayers' money has made, for instance, or another definition of public space, that is. Uh, uh, dangerously short of what, what, what future we are entering. I mean, for me, the internet is a public space because every information goes through a computer and every computer, like, do you know that all your emails are being read before they get to you? And what are the obligations of the people who have these algorithms reading your emails? You know, what is, can, you know, a four-year-old can read an email, so do we need to think about what do we have to filter? What is appropriate for a four-year-old? I, I just, I'm not giving the answer, but I'm happy to provide the question because I think that's the direction we are heading. And I don't believe that the, the, um, the answer will be uh, yes, anything go, and, or no, and we have to protect everything that is technically in our realm because that realm is growing rapidly and um, I'm almost a bit uh, afraid of how fast it our ability grows. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. I think there are two more questions, then we'll wrap up. Uh, I have a question that's um, sort of in a different direction. And where is curatorship in all of this discussion about censorship? Because it seems to me that could be a very pivotal uh, position to, I don't know, um, in creating a display or, or saying, no, we won't. So, sorry, the question is, what, what is what, the role? What is the role of curatorship and how right. powerful are curators in this in terms, of, in terms of being able to censor? Well, I, I, I definitely oh, don't censor the artists that I work with, but I find um, I, I, I take the time to fully understand their art and what their message is and create a space that accurately portrays that and that a viewer can walk in and understand what the art is about in the space. Okay, last question, comment? Um, I, I'm 
concerned with being patronized. Um, you know, I, I don't want somebody else to tell me what's going to trigger my anxiety or, or, you know, and I'm not entirely sure when I'm a person of privilege or when I'm a person likely to be triggered. And I don't want somebody else to tell me which side I'm on. So, you know, if I were to walk into a TTC station and see nasty words directed at the minority that I identify with or, or, or at women, I have a number of choices to deal with that. Um, I happen to love public art. I just, I love the idea of public art. I love the idea of being exposed to stuff I hate. Um, you know, I, I even like graffiti because I like knowing that there are people out there doing this wanting to have an effect on the world around them. It might be something that really deeply offends me and I've seen a lot of that stuff too. Um, but that, that it's there says something about the fact that we live in a very uh, multifoliate society. I, I really tired of being protected. And I, you know, Nadine Strawson, who will be speaking here, wrote a book about um, feminists, in uh, fe feminists in favor of pornography. And I really, that, that book is a strong and active piece saying, stop trying to protect me, I'm an adult. I can, I can really make decisions for myself, and I don't need the patriarchy to do this for me, nor do I need people to tell me that I'm in a position of privilege, and I have to be careful of those vulnerable people, however they are identified from one day to the next. So, you know, I, I think that when we're talking about censorship in art, it's a very vibrant um, issue, and I think it's something we all need to grapple with and understand ourselves as being on more than one side at any given time. Well, thank you very much for your comment. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like you to join me in thanking our three panelists, uh, Tim and Yalika and, and Uli. And And I want our panelists to join in thanking you for a vibrant, exciting audience. A measure of success of these events, in my view, is how much the audience gets engaged. And this was a wonderful audience. Thank you very much for coming.